Yes, and amen. Praise the Lord. He is risen. He is risen Praise be to God. I stepped into this sanctuary. How beautiful it is this morning. How beautiful you look today. And how wonderful is his presence among us. His spirit is here. He is alive. Which means he is with us. And he wants to bless us with his great love. I hope as you came in, you received uh, a bulletin, perhaps. Of course, we have the lyrics for you to sing. But we also hope you grabbed this. You'll hear more about all that's happening in our church in these days. We want to begin with just a welcome to all of our guests in particular. We're so glad you're here. I've met a lot of guests already at our sunrise service and another service. We are so glad you're here. Maybe you're one, like a lot of people, uh, I met even today who joined Park City years ago, but have moved away. But they're back because this is the place to be on Easter Sunday. Nothing like Easter Sunday at Park City's Baptist Church. Maybe you haven't been here in a while and you're back. You're welcome. And we're so glad that you're here. Let us serve you today in some way. But let's do this. Let's bless one another with the love of Easter and the fact that our Savior is risen. Let's all stand and welcome one another right where you are. Let's do that. Thank you, and you will remain standing as we continue to worship. Christ the Lord is risen today. Lift your voice with the choir as we sing to our Lord and to our God. Christ the Lord is risen today.
Would you pray with me? Our Father, our declaration this day is that of believers all across this planet this morning. He is risen indeed. And Father, I pray for each of us in this service today that you would infuse within our heart the hope and joy of that first Easter Sunday morning. Would you speak to us as we worship? And Father, as we open your word, would you speak to the need that we bring into this place? Would you help us to know what it means to follow you, not just this day, but all the days of our life? And may we rejoice in our Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we do want to welcome you to the third of our six Sunday morning services at Park City's Baptist Church. Whether you're joining us online or you're here in the sanctuary, it has been a wonderful day. And for those of you in this service, we want to thank you for moving to a lesser attended service. You've made room for those coming at 1045, and we want to thank you for it. You know, if you're here today as our guest and you heard Pastor Jeff say he's met a number of guests, I've met a number of guests, we want to say welcome. Whether this is your first time or you're returning, we're glad that you're here. And you're going to find on your bulletin on the very back of the order of worship a QR code. You could scan that right now. Let us know that you're here. We'd love to be able to serve you, to pray for you. And if you prefer paper, there's a paper uh, guest card in your pew rack. You can complete that. And then at the end of the service, I'll be in the back along with others. We'd love to meet you. You could bring that to us or there are offering boxes that you could place it in. But we want to welcome you today. We also want to extend an invitation to all of you who are either new members or you're new to this church. In two weeks, April 14th, I'll be leading a class we call Discover Park Cities. It's an opportunity for you to come and to hear about this church family, our mission, and the values that drive us. It's a lot of fun, and it's a great time to ask questions. So you can go to our website, pcbc.org. You can find information there. If you would, register. That way we can be prepared for you. But again, that's coming up in two weeks. Something else I'd say about that uh, 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 pcbc.org, and that is even for longtime church members, I would encourage you to look at it. So whether you're new to the church or you're a longtime member, you're going to see the breadth of the ministries in this church for all generations, all life stages, how we're seeking to meet needs here in our city, how we're seeking to be a presence down on the border and in the Caribbean basin, Central America, how God's using this church in Asia and in Africa. And it will give you an appreciation for how we come together and out of living lives of generosity, we seek to serve needs. It takes all of us. It takes our prayers. It takes our financial generosity. So this morning as we give, we give to the very glory of God. And we give so that the good news of Jesus might ring forth right here. Vacation Bible schools, Sunday mornings, all the activities on this campus. But across our city, and we believe by faith across the world. And I want to remind you, you can give online, pcbc.org. You can give at the offering boxes as you leave today, or there also you can mail to our physical address. So would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for the opportunity to gather in worship and, Father, to live a life of generosity in worship. And so, Father, would you use all the events of these coming months to your great glory, and would you use the gifts this week to share the love of Jesus. Would you use your church? It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We can rejoice. He's king. And sing to our king. Lift your voice. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King and Lord. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and try Lord. Lift up your Lord. Lift up your voice. Jesus the Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our stains, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice, love, and
blessing it is to sing to our Lord who remembers Holy Week, his sacrifice for us. Let's sing of what he did and then how he's come to be resurrected in our hearts. A beautiful new Matthew Merker song, See the Destined Day. Listen to the choir and myself as we sing the first verse. See the destined day arise, see a willing sacrifice. Jesus, to redeem our loss, hangs upon the shameful cross. Jesus, who but you could bear, wrath so great and justice fair. Every pang and bitter woe, finishing your life of woe. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lamb of God for sinners slain. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus Christ, we praise your name. Now lift your voice with us. Who but Christ had dared to drain, steeped in God? the cup of pain and with tender body bear thorns and nails and piercing spear slain for us the water flowed mingle from your sign with blood sign to all attesting eyes of the faith sacrifice hallelujah hallelujah lamb of god for sin slain hallelujah hallelujah jesus christ we praise your name holy jesus Jesus, grant us grace in that sacrifice to place all our trust for life renewed, pardon sin and promise good. Grant us grace to sing your praise round your throne through endless days. Ever the sons of light, blessing, honor, glory, might. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lamb of God for sinners slain. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus Christ, we bless your name. God's people said, Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. 
But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.
Praise the Lord. Hey, let's thank our worship leaders, our lead worshipers for leading us so well today. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Choir and orchestra. Praise God. And every week. Hey, let's pray together. Lord, as we open your word now, we pray that you will speak to us. We acknowledge that you are alive, that your spirit is in this place. And you are seeking to speak into every heart here. Those of us who are on the journey, walking this life's path, and those who are struggling, all of us in varying degrees, some disillusioned, many doubting, some of us despairing today. Some of us are filled with joy and we're so thankful. Lord, we all, whatever we're going through, we offer our hearts to you. I pray that you'll speak to us or do what only you can do by your spirit. Speak through your word, speak through me and help us to come to you. I pray for those who do not know you to come to faith today, to give their lives to you. The only one who is worthy of our lives. So Lord, speak to us, your children, we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Again, it's so great to see you today. So your view of God determines your response to God, right? Whatever you think or or, or about Jesus, when you think of Jesus, it will determine what kind of disciple you'll become as you imitate him, right? It was A.W. Tozer, the great theologian who famously wrote, what comes into our minds when we think of God is the most important thing about us. Now, today, we're going to examine who Jesus really is. Some of you know that, uh, that I'm an artist. I love art. I love the intersection of faith and art. Art was actually my undergrad work. I love art history and the beauty of art that draws us to Jesus. Today, we're going to look at one of the most enchanted stories in all of Scripture. So I want to ask you, how many of you uh, recognize this portrait right here? This is called The Head of Christ. It's by Warner Salmon. There it is not. (laughs) All right. This is going to, this is, all right. Just imagine. Hey, there he is. How many of y'all recognize this? I'm curious. How many of y'all recognize this painting? Yeah. I mean, real quick, if y'all respond quickly, because some, I've talked to several people this week. Oh, yes, that was in my grandparents' house. He's in their den. Or someone, oh, that was, in the, that was in the church I grew up in, right? I mean, some of y'all are thinking that way. This painting uh, by Warner Salmon uh, was uh, done in 1940, so it's pre-World War II. I show this because this painting became, uh, it has become, the most reproduced image of Jesus in the history of the world. A half billion Reproductions of this painting have been all over the world and for many, a couple generations, I suppose, when you think of Jesus, you think of him. Now, what do you you notice about this this painting? You notice that he's staring off at something. He's very serious, stoic. He's backlit. It almost looks like he's in a studio, right? He's got great hair. I I see that. Um, It's almost a mullet, but it's not quite a mullet. Um... I say this because he looks like, well, he looks like the artist. Warner Salmon is an American. He's a Scandinavian American. And some of you for another generation, maybe it was, maybe it was this, this guy who played Jesus in the Jesus film, which has been uh, translated into 2,100 languages and shown all over the world. We've been a part of this. I've been, I've seen this film shown in places like Africa and India. Millions of people have come to, come to Christ by watching the film based on the book of Luke, by the way, that we've been walking through. Now for others of us, it might've been, I don't know, 20 some odd years ago, maybe it was this Jesus. It was uh, Jim Caviezel who played in the passion of the Christ, or perhaps now a days uh, it's this Jesus, uh, Jonathan Rumi, who plays Jesus in anybody? And the Chosen, that's right, which is amazing, by the way, which is awesome. Now, one of my um, uh, thoughts here is we don't know what Jesus looked like, right? And that's really not so much the point, but a group of forensic scientists and theologians, archaeologists, came together in 2002 and they, 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 were, they had access to a lot of skulls and skeletons in Jerusalem, in Israel. 
seeking to look to see what might have he looked like. So they put together, uh, they scanned a bunch of skulls and they put together a composite of what Jesus likely would have looked like or a first century man. They came with this guy. Um, Now, all of this to say that we really don't know what he looked like. Again, one of my favorite artists throughout all of art history, my favorite era or period of, of history in art is the golden age of the Dutch masters, of which Rembrandt is uh, probably my favorite uh, and really a well-known of, among them. He, in the 1600s, he had his own head of Christ, okay? And he, uh, he portrayed Jesus like this. Uh, we see a different take, right? And so my point is this. Every era of time, every group of people on the planet, we want Jesus to... To look like us. We want him to act like us. We want him to to think like us and vote like us. We want him to agree with us. Would be really good, right? Voltaire's the one, the French philosopher. He's the one who said, among others, but he was the first that I could find to say, God created us in his image and then we returned the favor. Right? So we've all been on this journey But Jesus, and today we're at very, very places on the journey. But your view of Jesus determines your response to him. And it determines how you think he's alive in the world and how he's moving and how he's acting. It'll it'll determine whether you respond to him or not. And again, in what way you think he is actually bringing his kingdom in the world. Today we're going to look at the story of two disciples. This is one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. They knew exactly what he looked like. And they still didn't recognize him. We're going to look at an unexpected conversation. You might be tracking with where I'm going, some of you. An unexpected confrontation with the truth about who Jesus really is up against preconceived ideas. And then there's this unexpected confirmation of who he really is. And then... That's where our lives are changed. My prayer, our prayer for you is that you would encounter the risen Jesus because he's alive and he is speaking today. And if you have come to believe that all that exists is in the natural world, you're not open to spiritual things. I want to challenge you today. He is speaking into your heart today. And by faith, you can come to him. This passage is found in Luke 24. You can turn there in your Bible. You have one in front of you there. I'll show some of the scriptures here, but I won't, I won't go through all of these verses. We're going to tell this amazing story. Again, one of the most enchanted stories in all the Bible. Luke 24 begins, you can see there, uh, if you open the word, it begins with it's Easter Sunday morning. Uh, the disciples do not yet know that Jesus is alive, but the women go to the tomb And they're told that he's alive. So think about this. The women last at the cross, first at the tomb. And with all that's being said about women in the church in these days, women are the first to proclaim the gospel that Jesus is alive. God chooses women to go, watch this, to the apostles to tell them. That Jesus is alive. And of course, a group of men, they don't believe him. But their message goes forth from that day and it it sends a shock wave through the world and it continues today. And friend, that wave of his spirit is here today and he's speaking into your heart right now. The truth of what has happened that we remember on this day. First, let's look at this unexpected conversation. All right. Have you met the real Jesus? This is a valid question for all of us, myself included. Am I truly pursuing the real Jesus? Because to the degree we get this wrong is to the degree that we will not follow him as Lord and present him to the world. And this is a big problem in our culture today, a misunderstanding of how he will accomplish his work in the world. So verse 13, it says this, that very day, this is Resurrection Sunday, Afternoon, okay, it's getting uh, late afternoon. Two of them were going to the village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. Okay, all these 
things. What are all these things? All the things that Luke has told us. And all the things that have happened. Jesus uh, dying on the cross. And, 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 and it says here, while they were talking and discussing together. I, I love this. Jesus himself drew near. He starts walking along with them. And, and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now this is worth noting. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Some have said, well, it's getting dark, it's late. They wouldn't have thought a man crucified, they saw crucified on Friday, would be walking with them on Sunday. Yes, yes, but something else is going on here. This is really interesting. Consider this. Now, this is a a picture of the road to Emmaus. Some of you have been to uh, Israel, and uh, this is not a painting. This is an actual picture of the road to Emmaus. It's seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Imagine, okay? Imagine. Seven miles. Do the math. Two hours, two and a half hours. They're walking with Jesus. For two hours, they're walking along with him. And as we'll see, these two are in the inner circle. Okay? They know all of the apostles. All 12 of them. Now, 11 They know the whole story. They're very close. They're not one of the 12, one of the 11, but they're very close in this inner group. They saw him crucified on Friday. And look at this. It says, and he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still. They stopped walking and just stopped. Looking sad. And then one of them named Cleopas answered him. Now, this is interesting. In my studies, I've come to believe what a lot of scholars believe. I think Cleopas and Clopas are the same person in the New Testament, in the, particularly in, in this, this story, this part of the story. And, and I say that because he is Mar- Clopas is married to Mary. Mary is the, the mother of James the Lesser, we call her. She's, you always hear about the other Mary. So there's Mary Magdalene. You know, there's Mary, the mother of Jesus, and then the other Mary. This is the other Mary that he's married to. So my point is this, it seems likely this is husband and wife, Clopas and Mary walking together back home. They're going to Emmaus and they explain to him that the chief priests and rulers delivered Jesus up to the Romans and they crucified him in verse 21. No, no, before that, it says, are you the only visitor, I love this, to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in, in there in these days? Like you're, not the only, you're the only one who hasn't heard about this. And don't you love this? Jesus then, then says to them, yo, yo, what things? Like, what, what are y'all talking about? Now, what's happening here? Why? Is he just playing them? No, I, I think he, he's saying, I, I want to I hear from you. I want to hear your perspective. I want to see how you're taking this. How, are, how did you see things? Let's talk about it. Friend, this is significant. Jesus has entered into your conversation. Our conversation today. He's entered into the pathway that you find yourself on today. Wherever you are. He walks at your pace. He enters in your cadence He will not go ahead of you or behind you. He's not taken back by your doubt or your disillusionment. Look at this in verse 21. But, key word here, the answer. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yeah, besides all this, it's now the third day since all these things have happened. These two are sad. We've already heard. They're disillusioned. They're discouraged. They're despairing. They're done. For them, the cross was the end. It wasn't a victory. It wasn't, it was the end of a movement they thought was going to change everything. And now they leave thinking it's just a fantasy. Now Jesus is dead. Some of you are there today. Maybe you're done. In fact, maybe it's a wonder that you're here at all. Think about this. Maybe you're disillusioned because of people that you have loved, you thought were following the real Jesus, have actually really let you down or hurt you in some way. It happens. Maybe you're discouraged. 
because you wonder if he really sees you. Maybe you're a bit disappointed or even doubting that he even is aware of what you're going through right now in your life. Maybe you're confused. They're experiencing all of this. But can I say this? Maybe the disenchantment, maybe the discouragement and despair in your life, I want to lovingly offer this, is because of unmet expectations. That's what they're dealing with. And I think what is happening here is that we need to see that who the real Jesus is, who God is, starts with him and not with us. Not with others who've let you down. See, they thought he would redeem Israel by being a political Messiah. A liberating king is what that means literally. And he was that. But they thought he was going to come as a national leader to restore Israel. He has a much, much bigger plan than a small plot of land over in the Middle East. He's got the whole world in mind. He wants to draw every person on the planet for every tribe and nation all over the world to him. They thought he was going to take down the oppressive powers of the empire by force. They could not have imagined any other way. But he did come as a king. And he is bringing his kingdom. And it's through the force of love that he's changing the hearts of people. See, there was a gap, friends. Don't miss this. A gap between who they thought he was and who he actually was. How he would bring the kingdom in the world and how he's actually bringing the kingdom in the world. And this is a major challenge for us in our day. But we know the way. When Pilate brought Jesus out, after they beat him, he said, this is your king. And they said, do you remember? They said, we have no other king but Caesar. Friends, we as Christians proclaim today, and we need to proclaim every day, we have no other king but Jesus. He's the one. He's the one we follow. And look how wonderful he is. He meets us in the midst of our disillusionment. I want you to see this. He walks into right alongside us in our doubts and our discouragement. He keeps pace with us. But if you're going to discover who he really is, you're going to have to be confronted with the truth about who he is. Jesus changes his tone. Now we see an unexpected confrontation they didn't see coming because these two insiders had seen Jesus uh, betrayed by, by, by Judas. They knew he was. They'd heard about how he changed the Last Supper. They saw him die. They thought it was a tragic end of a movement they'd given their lives to. And now Jesus changes the tone. Watch this in verse 25. He said to them, oh, foolish ones. And what this means, watch this. This means without thought. It means intellectually lazy. It means you haven't reasoned through this. This is powerful. There's reason and faith. Look at this. He says, and slow to heart, to believe. This is what trips many of us up today. All that the prophets have spoken And then in verse 26, he says, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? So isn't it clear that this had to happen? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Think about this. For two hours, Jesus offers commentary on the entire Bible and how it points to him. What did he say? We got a hunch. He would have said in Genesis, I'm the breath of life. He is the seed of Eve that would crush the serpent. He's the son of Abraham. He is in Exodus, the Passover lamb. He's the great I am. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. In Numbers, he's fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's Moses' voice. He's the law fulfilled. He's the son of David. I could go on and on. In Isaiah 7, he's the one who would be born of a virgin. He would be called Emmanuel, God now, with us. Isaiah 53, he would have said in verse 2. Now, here's a portrait of him. There's no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. 
He was a man of suffering. Nothing that would cause us to desire him in seeing him. There's a portrait. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men. Verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted. Isaiah tells us, like a lamb to the slaughter, he did not open his mouth. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was, he was brought on him was the iniquity of your sin and mine. All the vile, grotesque sins of all people on the planet was placed on him. He's the lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. He's the prince of peace. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the son of God, Jesus Christ, God, our father and our Lord. Lord. This is who he is. And it says then that their eyes were starting to be revealed. I think they're starting to go, what is happening here? No wonder he said in John chapter 5, verse 39, to the Pharisee, you studied the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. What's he saying here? We studied the scriptures all the time here at our church. What was he he's saying? You think that it's by knowing enough It's by your good works. If you think the Bible is a list of rules, do's and don'ts, what do I need to do? What can I bring to the table? He says, these are the very scriptures that testify about me. And yet you refuse to come to me. It's why we say that Christianity is not a religion of rules. It is a relationship. You must come to him to receive life. He is the Logos. He is the purpose of life. He is the divine word. He walked into their conversation. And friends, don't miss this. He's walking. He has walked into your life today. He is speaking by his spirit. And we are confronted with these words. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. This is the exclusive claim that only he can make. All of scripture points to him. He alone has lived the perfect life. He died on the cross for our sin. This exclusive claim includes everybody to come to him because it's by faith, not by works, not by how smart we are. But we believe and we trust in him. And he says, if you have just faith of a mustard seed, watch this. Receive me. I'll help it grow. I'll walk with you. I will come and and, and show you more of myself. This unexpected conversation leads to an unexpected confrontation today with the truth. You just thought you were coming on Easter Sunday. Jesus is meeting you right now. And he is asking you, come to me. But here's what happens. You know how this story ends. Then it's met with an unexpected confirmation. I love this. It says they're almost home. The sun is setting. They want Jesus to stay with them and he goes home with them. And it says when he was at the table with them, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to them and their eyes were open and they recognized him. Now here's Rembrandt's uh, version of how he captures the moment. If we have that. In, in 1648, yeah, he, he painted this painting. Not only he was, was he the master of, of light and shadow, he was the master of the passions and the heart of, of each of us. So he invites us into the painting. Uh, he, he has these subtle moments bringing real people into real moments. And right here, this is the moment when they recognize him. What's going on here? It says they recognized him. And they were no longer kept from not seeing it. But now it says that he reveals himself. What's going on here? Well, two things. One, Jesus reveals himself when he wants to. But secondly, why didn't they recognize him first? They would not have walked alongside him. They wouldn't have heard the whole redemptive story. They, they, They wouldn't have come to understand what they now know in Scripture. They saw it. They see it in scripture. He's so patient with us, friends. He's patient with you today. Your doubt doesn't doesn't shock him. He says, come to me. Your sin doesn't repel him. It triggers his love towards you. 
This is the Savior that he is. Look at this closer shot. We see here this precisely the moment. And do you recognize the pattern? Did you catch it? Luke's already told us this pattern in Luke twenty two nineteen. 19. It's the Last Supper. He took the bread. He blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it. And it's in that moment that their eyes are open. And they see. Because, watch this. They learned through Scripture. Now through the Spirit of God. And speaking to us this morning. To you. Jesus was taken. He was blessed as the Son of God to come into the world. He was broken for us upon the cross. He is given to the world. His grace is given to you. Rembrandt has another depiction of this where where we see this Jesus disappearing from their sight. Suddenly this silhouette of Jesus uh, later he disappears. But what's happening here? It says that they, their hearts were burning within them and they saw that it was him. They saw it was Jesus. And so immediately, here's what happens. After this moment, they go to Jerusalem. They tell the apostles. They know right where they are. And by this time, they've heard that he's alive. And, they, and some have seen him. And then these two show up and they say, yeah, well, we know. We've seen him. And so the the word starts to spread and the confirmation of who he really is, the risen Christ, is now going forth and they're given a new commission to go and tell the world. And friends, listen, this story is our story. It's your story today. This is the story of all of life. Jesus walks into our lives and he says, join me on the walk, follow me. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And friends, if you give Christ your life today, watch this. He will take you. He'll bless you with his grace. You can be totally forgiven, fully loved by him. He will break you of your pride because it's killing you and everybody around you. He will break you of your pride for your good and to his glory. And then he will give you to the world to live the life you've been called to live and show everyone exactly who he is by the way you love and live. So I want us to pray together. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes with me? I want to ask you, do you know him? Have you ever received Christ as your Lord and Savior? On this day, the day of days, I want to give you an opportunity to do so. If you're here today and you want to solidify, you want to settle this once and for all. He has spoken to you. The Spirit of God has spoken in your heart through His Word. And it's the power of God that that is in you. They say later, these two, didn't we know, didn't we see, it was burning in our hearts. Friends, is your heart burning today? Are you wrestling? Give him your life. By faith, not by anything you need to do. No works, no knowledge, other than the fact that Jesus is Lord of all. You can trust him. He died on the cross for you. But you must receive his grace as a free gift. And if you're here today and you want to receive him right now, I want you to just raise your hand, not for me or anybody else, but for the Lord. Say, Lord, here, I'm right here. I am right here. Here I am. I give you my life. I give you my life. And now others of you are here and you've received Christ. You know that you have. You know he is Lord of your life. And you want to recommit your life to him. Hearing this message, his spirit speaking to you. What is he calling you to do? Some of you need to join the fellowship of the church. Some of you need to commit yourself fully to this local church or wherever you may live. You need to be baptized. What what is it? What will you do to mark the day? You could at least do this along with me. If you know him, everyone's head bowed and eyes closed. You can just raise your hand and say, yes, I'm a disciple of Jesus. I praise God for him. And Lord, here I am. I raise my hand high to say, Lord... I give you my life anew. You are Lord of my life. And I praise you.
for the grace you've given to me through the cross. Lord, we praise you, we love you, and we thank you for how good you are to us. And we go now to celebrate your great love and to show the world who you really are as we seek you day after day. In your name we pray. And everyone said, amen and praise the Lord. Hey, before you go and before we sing, you can join us next week. We are the Easter people. And I just want to challenge you. I know today's the day where we kind of all converge on a Sunday. We're all here. But I want to encourage you to come back. Next week is, is Resurrection Sunday again. And we're starting a new series um, that we're real excited about. And it's called Is God. 